Now Gorgias took 5,000 infantry and 1,000 picked cavalry, and this division moved out by night to fall upon the camp of the Jews and attack them suddenly. Men from the citadel were his guides, but Judas heard of it, and he and his mighty men moved out to attack the king's force in Emmaus, while the division was still absent from the camp. When Gorgias entered the camp of Judas by night, he found no one there, so he looked for them in the hills, because he said, These men are fleeing from us. At daybreak, Judas appeared in the plain with three thousand men, but they did not have armor and swords such as they desired, and they saw the camp of the Gentiles, strong and fortified, with cavalry round about it, and these men were trained in war. But Judas said to the men who were with him, Do not fear their numbers, or be afraid when they charge. Remember how our fathers were saved at the Red Sea, when Pharaoh with his forces pursued them. And now let us cry to heaven, to see whether he will favor us, and remember his covenant with our fathers, and crush this army before us today. Then all the Gentiles will know that there is one who redeems and saves Israel. When the foreigners looked up and saw them coming against them, they went forth from their camp to battle. Then the men with Judas blew their trumpets and engaged in battle. The Gentiles were crushed and fled into the plain, and all those in the rear fell by the sword. They pursued them to Gazara, and to the plains of Edumia, and to the Azotus and Jamnia, and three thousand of them fell. Then Judas and his force turned back from pursuing them. And he said to the people, Do not be greedy for plunder, for there is a battle before us. Gorgias and his force are near us in the hills, but stand now against our enemies and fight them, and afterward seize the plunder boldly. Just as Judas was finishing this speech, a detachment appeared, coming out of the hills. They saw that their army had been put to, put to flight, and that the Jews were burning the camp, for the smoke that, had, for the smoke that was seen showed what had happened. When they perceived this, they were greatly frightened, and when they also saw the army of Judas drawn up in the plain for battle, they all fled into the land of the Philistines. Then Judas returned to plunder the camp, and they seized much gold and silver, and cloth dyed blue and sea purple, and great riches. On their return, they sang hymns and praises to heaven, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Thus Israel had a great deliverance that day. Those of the foreigners who escaped went and reported to Lysias all that had happened. When he heard it, he was perplexed and discouraged, for things had not happened to Israel as he had intended, nor had they turned out as the king had commanded him. But the next year he mustered 60,000 picked infantrymen and 5,000 cavalry to subdue them. They came into Indumea and encamped at Bethzur, and Judas met them with 10,000 men. When he saw that the army was strong, he prayed, saying, Blessed are you, O Savior of Israel, who did crush the attack of the mighty warrior by the hand of your servant David, and did give the camp of the Philistines into the hands of Jonathan, the son of Saul, and of the man who carried his armor. So do you hem in this army by the hand of your people Israel, and let them be ashamed of their troops and their cavalry. Fill them with cowardice, melt the boldness of their strength. Let them tremble in their destruction. Strike them down with the sword of those who love you, and let all who know your name praise you with hymns. Then both sides attacked, and there fell of the army of Lysias five thousand men. They fell in action. And when Lysias saw the rout of his troops and observed the boldness which inspired those of Judas, and how ready they were, either to live or to die nobly, he departed to Antioch and enlisted mercenaries to invade Judea again with an even larger army. Then said Judas and his brothers, Behold, our enemies are crushed. Let us go up to cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. So all the army assembled, and they went up to Mount Zion, and they saw the sanctuary desolate, the altar, the altar profaned, and the gates burned. In the courts they saw bushes sprung up as in thicket, or as on one of the mountains. They saw also the chambers of the priests in ruins. Then they tore their clothes, and mourned with great lamentation, 
and sprinkled themselves with ashes. They fell face down on the ground and sounded the signal on the trumpets and cried out to heaven. Then Judas detailed men to fight against those in the citadel until he had cleansed the sanctuary. He chose blameless priests devoted to the law, and they cleansed the sanctuary and removed, removed the defiled stones to an unclean place. They deliberated what to do about the altar of burnt offering, which had been profaned, and they thought it best to tear it down, lest it bring reproach upon them, for the Gentiles had defiled it. So they tore down the altar and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple hill until there should come a prophet to tell what to do with them. Then they took unhewn stones as the law directs and built a new altar like the former one. They also rebuilt the sanctuary and the interior of the temple and consecrated the courts. They made new holy vessels and brought the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table into the temple. Then they burned incense on the altar and lighted the lamps on the lampstand, and these gave light in the temple. They placed the bread on the table and hung up the curtains. Thus they finished all the work they had undertaken. Early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month of Chislev, in the 148th year, they rose and offered sacrifice, as the law directs, on the new altar of burnt offering, which they had built. At the very season and on the very day that, it, that the Gentiles had profaned it, it was dedicated with songs and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and worshipped and blessed heaven, who had prospered them. So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness. They offered a sacrifice of deliverance and praise. They decorated the front of the temple with golden crowns and small shields. They restored the gates and the chambers for the priests and furnished them with doors. There was very great gladness among the people and the reproach of the Gentiles was removed. Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season the days of the dedication of the altar should be observed with gladness and joy for eight days, beginning with the twenty-fifth day of the month of Chislev. At that time they fortified Mount Zion with high walls and strong towers round about to keep the Gentiles from coming and trampling them down as they had done before. And he stationed a garrison there to hold it. He also fortified Bethsur, so that the people might have a stronghold that faced Idumea. O oh death, how bitter is the reminder of you to one who lives at peace among his possessions, to a man without distractions, who is prosperous in everything, and who still has the vigor to enjoy his food. O oh death, how welcome is your sentence to one who is in need and is failing in strength, very old and distracted over everything, to one who is contrary and has lost his patience. Do not fear the sentence of death. Remember your former days and the end of life. This is the decree from the Lord for all flesh. And how can you reject the good pleasure of the Most High? Whether life is for ten or a hundred or a thousand years, there is no inquiry, inquiry about it in Hades. The children of sinners are abominable children and they frequent the haunts of the ungodly. The inheritance of the children of sinners will perish, and on their posterity will be a perpetual reproach. Children will blame an ungodly father, for they suffer reproach because of him. Woe to you, ungodly men, who have forsaken the law of the Most High God. When you are born, you are born to a curse, and when you die, a curse is your lot. Whatever is from the dust returns to dust, so the ungodly go from curse to destruction. The mourning of men is about their bodies, but the evil name of sinners will be blotted out. Have regard for your name, since it will remain for you, longer than a thousand great stores of gold. The days of a good life are numbered, but a good name endures forever. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us, from God the Father 
and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children following the truth, just as we have been commanded by the Father. And now I beg you, lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we follow his commandments. This is the commandment, as you have heard from the beginning, that you follow love. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Look to yourselves that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. Anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting, for he who greets him shares his wicked work. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, but I hope to come to see you and talk with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. The Elder to the Beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in health. I know that it is well with your soul. For I greatly rejoiced when some of the brethren arrived and testified to the truth of your life, as indeed you do follow the truth. No greater joy can I have than this, to hear that my children follow the truth. Beloved, it is a loyal thing you do when you render any service to the brethren, especially to strangers, who have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey as befits God's service. For they have set out for, the, for his sake, and have accepted nothing from the heathen. So we ought to support such men, that we may be fellow workers in the truth. I have written something to the church, by, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge my authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, accusing me falsely with evil words, and not content with that, he refuses himself to welcome the brethren and also stops those who want to welcome them and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. He who does good is of God. He who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has testimony from everyone, and from the truth itself. I testify to him too, and you know my testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk together face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. Judas exhorts his men not to fear the greater numbers of their enemies, but rather to remember how our fathers were saved at the Red Sea when Pharaoh with his forces pursued them. Like his father Mattathias, Judas calls upon a remembrance of God's saving deeds of the past to build trust in the present. Armed with this lively faith, they call upon God, who grants them victory. A memory soaked in scripture is a memory fertile for faith. In St. John's last two letters, he brings together two key themes that are like arms by which he embraces his readers, the twin themes of truth and love. In his second letter, he extols the elect lady, the church, because her children are following the truth. In his third letter to Gaius, he praises him saying, you follow the truth. As deceitful teachers are spreading error, he reminds the faithful that being in the truth keeps us on the path to right loving. How would John react to those today who would divide truth and love, dogma and charity?